Welcome. This is Jocko Podcast number two with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. So people ask me regularly what books I like. In fact, Tim Ferriss asked me, which he asked all of his guests, um, what books I have given to people, what books I regularly give to people. How do I, what, what books do I gift? Which I actually am not a real big gift giver <laughs> for some reason. I don't know why, but uh, I don't really expect gifts from people and people of the world should not expect gifts from me either. Lessons, not gifts. Yes, yes. yes. So, but there is uh, one book that I have given to a few people in my life. And it is a book that was and still is very influential on me and especially on my perspective of leadership and really especially in combat leadership. And that book is called About Face. Now, here it is right here, About Face. If you can't, if you're listening to audio, it's an 800, over 800 page book. It's written by a guy named Colonel David Hackworth. Hackworth was a kind of a soldier's soldier. And born in 1930, joined the Merchant Marines towards the end of World War II at the age of 14, had to lie to get into the Merchant Marines, got done with that gig. He joined the Army just after World War II. What do he mean, was still what do you too mean young. Had, sorry, what, what do you mean he had to lie to get into the Merchant So he was too young. He was oh, he uh, 14 years old. He lied about his age to Dang. get in at 14 to the Merchant Marines. When he went a few years later to join the Army, he was still too young and had to lie again to get into the Army. Once he was in the Army, he went over to Europe and he served directly underneath the war hardened veterans of World War II. And those are the guys that brought him up in the ranks and taught him about hard training. <laughs> and really that's what they taught him. And, and again, that's one of those things that I look back on my military career and the Vietnam veterans that were still in the SEAL teams when I just got in the SEAL teams in 1990, 1991, there were still some, some veterans around from Vietnam. And those guys, when those guys spoke, you listened because they had some word to put out. And I absolutely listened. And a lot of those lessons that those guys taught me, those Vietnam veterans taught me, I carried on to them. I mean, I, I held on to them and took notes and passed them on. And a lot of those concepts are the basis of, of what we wrote about in Extreme Ownership. Mm. So he did that. Um, he ended up getting a fighting Korea. So Korea was kind of his, uh, where he first saw combat. He ended up getting a battlefield commission. And if you don't know what that means, that means you're, you're one of the foot soldiers. And all of a sudden they go, look, you're a good leader. We're going to put you in charge. And that's exactly what happened to him. He was wounded four times before the age of 21. Yeah. So the guy was a warrior. I'm going to read his uh, read the book dedication here from the beginning of About Face. It says dedication to Steve Prezenka, who is one of the World War II combat hardened veterans that taught him how to soldier. So it says to Steve Prezenka, who showed us how to soldier, to Henry De Boer, who showed us how to die, to Glover Johns who showed us how to lead. And to all the doughboys, the ground pounders, the grunts, the American infantrymen, past, present, and especially future, to them, this book is dedicated. So he wrote this book, obviously, to pass on the lessons that he learned. And I got to make a note here and read a little section because he talks about Henry de Boer who showed us how to die. So this took place in the Korean War. And I'll go right into it. They're in a big firefight. And here's Hackworth. I saw a soldier prone on the ice. He'd been there a long time. I thought he was dead. But then I saw movement and I rushed out to get him. My God, I thought. It's De Boer. 
Private Henry C. DeBoer had been with George Company since early in the war. He was one of the few survivors from the original 3rd Platoon, basically because in those first hard months of combat, he had not seen even one good firefight. He had an uncanny sixth sense. He could always tell when the platoon was in for a major bloodletting, and invariably, he'd find an excuse to be somewhere else. So here's a guy that Hackworth is saying this guy was avoiding combat, yeah, yeah. Was <laughs> finding excuses. Normally, that excuse was going on sick call, which by regulation he was allowed to do, and you couldn't stop him even though you knew the only thing that was wrong with him was a chronic case of cowardice. So absolutely, he's being called a coward. DeBoer himself even admitted he was a coward, and we hated him for it. He was an outcast from the platoon. We even had a little song about him, which we'd sing in unison. Out of the dark, dreary Korean countryside comes the call of the DeBoer board. Sick call, sick call, sick call. He'd pulled, this, he'd pulled his stunt only yesterday as we were saddling up for this very operation. He'd sensed the bloodletting all right, but he hadn't figured that the foggy overcast covering the battlefield would not lift and the attack would be postponed. He'd returned from the dock last night with a clean bill of health, most surprised to see us. The rest of the platoon took great pleasure in the fact that his malingering little ass would be in the thick of things in the morning. So he, there was a big operation planned, and he was supposed to go on it. He snuck out, went to sick call, said he's sick. The, the, the operation got postponed because of weather. He shows back up, and here he is in the scrap. <laughs> Praying that he missed it. Right. Did miss it. Now, back to the book. Now, DeBoer was ashen-faced, hit in the chest or gut. I don't know. There was a lot of blood and well into shock. I knew he wasn't going to make it. Come on, DeBoer. You're going to be fine. You'll be all right, I said, giving him the old pep talk as I grabbed his jacket collar and started sliding him across the ice. But DeBoer said, no, Sarge. Just leave me. You're going to get hit. Just leave me, Sarge. Then suddenly he groaned. Sarge, I shit my pants. And that was it. He was gone. I left him and ran back. DeBoer, in death, became one of the greatest heroes of our outfit. It was true he'd never been anything in his army life but a coward. But he died right. He died like a man. He didn't say, take care of me. He said, leave me. Take care of yourself. And when I told the other guys the story, old DeBoer became a legend in the platoon. So that's the kind of thing that Hackworth saw as a young leader. From there, you know, he, when the Korean War ended, he was, again, highly decorated. Korean War ended, did time in a bunch of different units in between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. When the Vietnam War kicked off, he went right into the thick of it again. Ended up as a battalion commander in Vietnam. And here's his, here's his list of awards Two Distinguished Service Crosses, 10 Silver Stars, four Legions of Merit, Distinguished Flying Cross, eight Bronze Stars, eight Purple Hearts. So you have a guy here that is uh, obviously a highly dedicated soldier, mm -hmm. a guy that would do anything for the Army and for America. Mm-hmm. But, and this is a big but, <laughs> this guy was a rebel. He was a true rebel, and he went out and went against his officers. He went against the way the army was running a, a, the war in Vietnam, and eventually he went out in public on national television and spoke out against the Vietnam War and said that we should not fight there anymore. Mm -hmm. So he went on this TV program. It's called Issues and Answers. It was a big show in the, uh, in the 70s. And he did this interview. And again, you got to remember, this guy is an active duty, an active duty, highly decorated senior officer in the army. I mean, this guy is all, by all counts, should be the most dedicated. Mm-hmm. 
And here he is, and this is what he says. You know, this is one of the quotes from this interview. I think that the top managers of the army, and there's a big difference between a leader, a combat leader, and a manager. The top managers were so involved in systems analysis, in the normal bureaucracy of it all, they were, that they were fighting from day to day just to move paper that crossed their desk, and they couldn't see the forest for the trees. In February, when we went into Laos, we went into Laos conventionally. The idea was to block the enemy's supply routes, so we dropped in there. We paid a horrible. The Vietnamese paid a horrible price. Tremendous mistakes were made. Again, conventional thinking. He, he's gonna, he hounds on this a lot, this idea of conventional thinking. And again, you got a guy that's institutionalized. I mean, the guy's been in, in military service since he was 14 years old. Mm-hmm. You'd think that they would have him mentally sedated to a point where he would just think what they tell him to think, mm-hmm. but he does not. Mm-hmm. That's the dichotomy of this guy. Again, conventional thinking. Conventional thinking put us in that operation rather than have a light, mobile guerrilla force but a guerrilla force that belonged to the government of Vietnam or an American army operating in there like guerrilla. So he was saying the Vietnamese should be doing this. The, the South Vietnamese army should be doing this. Or if we're going to do it, we need to operate like guerrillas. It takes a thief to catch a thief. What we need is a thief. We don't need a conventionally trained FBI agent dashing through the woods with a large force behind him. We need small people, well-trained, highly motivated, and this is what we have not had. Because what we have now, and this is where you say to yourself, wow, because what we have now among the army is a bunch of shallow dilettantes who run from pillar to post trying to punch their card, serving minimum time at company level because the exposure, you are very close to the heat of the furnace there, meaning you can get in trouble easily. So he is on national television, a colonel in the army, uh, one of the most highly decorated individuals at the time, and he calls. He says the army is filled with a bunch of shallow dilettantes who run from pillar, pillar to post trying to punch their card and purposely avoiding combat is what that second piece means. Mm. You don't see this kind of behavior from army officers very often. <laughs> I, I will tell you that. Um, and here's kind of how he closed it out. She says, uh, the interviewer, the, or sorry, he says, the interviewer says, Colonel, do you think, do you feel it's possible you have become too emotionally involved in Vietnam? Mm-hmm. And he says, I have become emotionally involved in Vietnam. One couldn't have spent the number of years I spent in Vietnam without becoming emotionally involved. One couldn't see the number of young studs die or be terribly wounded without becoming emotionally involved. I just have seen the American nation spend so much of its wonderful, great young men in this country. I have seen our national wealth being drained away. I see the nation being split apart and almost being split asunder because of this war. And I am wondering to what end it is all going to lead to. So that is a devastating statement. And when it came out, they immediately, he put in his resignation papers immediately. And the army started to investigate him immediately. And they tried to, they tried to get him in trouble for every little minor infraction that had happened underneath his command at any time, in any situation. They really tried to come after him. Mm. And he ended up retiring. And... You know, I think one of the things that he expressed there is a dichotomy that anybody in a combat leadership position will feel. And, and that is, and I don't, I, in fact, this might be the largest dichotomy of all. And that's a big statement. Mm. And that is, as a combat leader, you are told and beyond being told you are ingrained and beyond being ingrained you are inherently inherently caring 
of your guys. Mm. There is no one more important than your guys. Yeah. And the dichotomy is as much as you care about these guys and you love these guys and you do anything for them. But that being said, it is your job to send these guys on operations that can kill them. Mm -hmm. So that is a huge dichotomy. And I think that's one of the things that Hackworth, when he saw it on a grand scale, because he could deal with it in his own groups, mm -hmm. but when he saw it on a grand scale, you know, young men being sent to their death, it's, it, it, it's I think, what, what turned him. Um, so he ended up, after this, you know, he kind of continued down that path and he moved out of America, he moved to Australia, mm. and he ended up, kind of playing a big role in the anti-nuclear weapons movement. And I mean, that's kind of where he went. Mm. So I, you know, Hack was a complex person. Hackworth, that's kind of his nickname. Everyone calls him Hack. Hack, Hack was a yeah. complex person. And I don't agree with everything that he says. I don't agree with everything that he does and or everything that he did. I don't worship the guy. Uh, and, you know, what's interesting about me questioning what his decisions and questioning his leadership is like, that's something I learned from him. Like, mm. don't even, don't listen to anybody 100%. Don't put, you know, you should always be questioning what people are saying and, and making sure and confirming it through other sources and other experiences that it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I always try to do with everything mm. is, is use that attitude. And... So I, 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 don't, I don't recall, and I was actually trying to come in here tonight, I was trying to figure out when I got this book, and I actually have no idea. I don't remember it. It like mm. appeared in my life at some point. <laughs> and sure. I don't know how. And no one ever made the recommendation to me. I just somehow ended up with it. Mm -hmm. and, but I got it. I, I got it before. One thing I do know is I got it before September 11th, 2001. When that happened, I had already read it. I already had it in my brain. Mm. But when I was in Ramadi in 2006, this, I, I, I literally read this book every night that I was not out in the field. Mm. I read this book every night. And, you know, I just opened it up. You could open up anywhere in, that, in this book and you could find something, some, some piece of information, some similar situation, some lesson learned that you could take from it mm. and it could guide you. And, and, you know, one of the, like, like for instance, and it, it all applied to what I was doing, the situation that I was in. So for instance, we were in Iraq and we were supposed to be working with Iraqi soldiers who are unmotivated, poorly equipped, poorly trained, uneducated, bad morale and that's and, and corrupt so they're the money is all disappearing it's mm. it's a horrible situation mm -hmm. and what was hackworth doing in vietnam well they were working with the south vietnamese army who was corrupt and unmotivated and poorly mm -hmm. trained and all those same things so they were dealing with the same things we were dealing with and that's one example of many uh i took a little break about three months into deployment I took a little break, and, and I'm not 100% sure why, but I found another book. Somebody had left a book mm. in our building, and the book was, speaking of dichotomy, the book was The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test by Tom Wolfe. Mm. And I think at this point, I, you know, three months into deployment, I think I needed a, some kind of mental uh, escape, you know, mm. at least, you know, I was, I, was, I was like dealing with combat all day, and then I'd go in my room and read about combat yeah. at night and I kind of was like, okay, you need to think about something else for 20 minutes or 10 minutes mm. and just get out of, get, get it out of your head. Mm -hmm. And I randomly found this book. So I said, oh, and I had read The Right Stuff by Tom Wolfe, which was a fantastic book. And so I said, oh, this, I'm sure this will be interesting as well. So as I read this book, 
the electric Kool-Aid acid test, which is about hippies and drugs and the 60s. And that's what it's about. Hate Ashbury, the whole nine yards. And uh, there's a quote in the middle that I actually pulled out because I'll never forget this quote and how this quote was so starkly contrasting with about face. Mm. And, and I'm going to read this quote and he's, and, and I kind of forget the whole setup to it, but they're at some kind of a concert and there's all this screaming and craziness going on at some rock and roll concert. And, you know, he says, I couldn't hear what they were screaming either, but you don't have to. They're screaming me, 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 I'm me. That's the cry of the ego. And that's the cry of this rally, this concert. Me, 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 me. And that's why wars get fought, ego. Because enough people want to scream, pay attention to me. And it was one of those things that I read and, I, and it was so starkly different from the situation that I was in where I was with these guys in my own task unit, the SEALs in my task unit, the Marines that were there on the ground with us, the Army soldiers that were down on the ground with us. And these guys were all so selfless. The last thing they cared in the world about was me, 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 me. Mm -hmm. And I got done with that book. And I went right back to about face because I, I related to it. I understood. And I, I said to myself, this is true. This is selfless. This is where I'm at right now. Yeah. So I went back into about face and I continued. And, and eventually this book is the, the one book that I've given to a few of the guys that worked closely for me. Uh, including, including Leif, Leif Babin, who, you know, one of my brothers who wrote extreme ownership with me and he's one of the guys that you know he's got he's got his copy and it's all dog-eared and marked up because it's a great book yeah. uh so obviously when we like on twitter and facebook when we asked for people to give us questions a lot of the questions are uh a lot of the questions are about leadership and so i i kind of as i thought about diving in a little bit to to this book and, and, and to talk about it a little bit. And of course you could spend, you, you, you know, we could do 50 episodes, 10 hours each on this book. There's so, so dense and filled with information, not to mention it's 800 pages long. Yeah. There's, um, but I wanted to get, I wanted to go a little bit deep on this one situation where David Hackworth, Colonel Hackworth had now gone into Vietnam and there was a, a battalion of soldiers and they were kind of a disaster. They were kind of the standard of like what, what had happened with some of the, the poor leadership in Vietnam and he took over. And again, just to kind of, to kind of lay out what Hackworth was like, here's a quote that kind of starts off the chapter. Hackworth was essentially a legend. Just before he arrived, I recall going to the G1 and asking who the new battalion commander was going to be. The deputy G G1 said, can't tell you. You know how personnel people are. They like to hit pocket everything. But he's Mr. Infantry. I thought, who the hell is Mr. Infantry? Of course, I'd read about David H. Hackworth. So his kind of nickname was Mr. Infantry. That was what his is, reputation. What does hip pocket mean? Meaning if, if the people that are in charge of uh, personnel and moving people around inside the military, mm -hmm. they know they know little bits of information. And instead of giving it to you, they keep it. They oh, keep gotcha. it close. They keep it in their yeah, hip pocket. Yeah. That's all it means. And then uh, to, to kind of explain, though, that, you know, there's some people that go, yeah, this guy's a, this guy's a great leader. He's coming in. But to kind of show you what the attitude of the troops is. You got to remember this is Vietnam. We got draftees. We got mm -hmm. hippies. We got all kinds of anti-American. I mean, it's crazy times. Uh, Doc Holly, this is another quote for, who's from a medic, Charles Windsor. Doc Holly and I were sitting in the aid station drinking beer and saying, God, this is going to be hell. We've got some G.I. Joe lifer out here who's going to just ruin us. 
That was probably the lowest point of morale in the battalion. Not only had we been taking a lot of casualties, but now it looked as if someone was going to come in and kick ass and make, a, and make career soldiers out of us. And it goes on to go through more quotes where they actually talk about a price on his head. The, the soldiers talked about, hey, we, we need to kill this guy before he gets us killed, mm. which is just kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you know, you hear about that. You hear about that in Vietnam, this idea of it's called fragging. There's a name for it. Mm. Hey, we're going to frag our officer means we're going to kill our own officer. And it's uh, something that definitely happened. And, and it's a, it, this is a, a perfect case of where people talked about it possibly happening. So to get into this chapter a little bit. Mm-hmm. Here's Hackworth talking about when he took over. There was no sense in showing this sorry outfit. I was in a state of shock. It wasn't just the command post group that it wasn't just that the command post group slept on cots inside tents, that they had folding chairs and stateside footlockers, portable radios, and plastic coolers filled with beer and coke at their firebase out in the field. More than that, it was that they had portable toilets too. So here he is. These guys are supposed to be out in the field and they have all this luxury. Mm. And that's something that we saw in Iraq where mm. there was certain bases where it, they had uh, Starbucks <laughs> and Subway sandwiches and McDonald's mm. literally had those things. And you, the further you go out into the fray, you get guys, I remember visiting some on my first deployment to Iraq, we'd go out to some, there'd be guys you know, completely in the bush living like just barely scraping by on one MRE a day. So the, now he's talking about the command post and he says that the command post apparently were blissfully unaware that just nearby their troops were crapping on the ground and not even covering it up. So you have complete just disaster situation going on here. And then the, the general that's in tar- charge of all these battalions, as he's about to put Hackworth in charge, a guy named General Yule, says, it's a pussy battalion. And I want tigers, not pussies. But he'd gotten it wrong. With the 4th Battalion, 39th Infantry, that's who he was taking over. It was not a question of feline degree. As far as I could see, this unit was not even a military organization. So that's that's what this guy walked into, Colonel Hackworth. It was total, he goes on to say, it was total disintegration. Throughout the fire base, amid the shit and toilet paper and the machine gun ammo laying in the mud were troops who wore love beads and peace symbols and looked more like something out of Haight-Ashbury than soldiers in the U.S. Army. All were low on spirit and a few were high, openly, on marijuana. There was minimum security. Few men carried or cared for their weapons. Most had let them go red with rust as they strolled around without them. Grenades weren't taped. And when a unit moved out, Most of the gunners wore their ammo Pancho Villa style, the ideal way to guarantee a weapon jam sometime down the track when dirty, dented cartridges were inserted into their M60s. So what we have here is a total lack of discipline. And another thing that this reminded me of was I was always trying to, when I was in the SEAL teams, I was trying to, pull as much information about war as I could. And one of the recent wars in recent times was when the Russians went into Chechnya the first time and they, they had a really hard time. Mm-hmm. And I read the after actions reports from the Russian officers that had taken troops there. And one of the ones that I remember, and I've looked for it to try and find it again. I don't know if it's, cla- I don't know, I don't know where it went, but I, I haven't been able to find it. But the guy basically says, it all started when the guys stopped shaving. And when they stopped shaving, then, they, then the next thing you knew, they weren't cleaning their guns. Then the next thing you knew, they weren't staying aware while they were on watch. And then the next thing you know, they were getting overrun and killed. So those little things, mm-hmm. those little things that you do right all the time are important. And that's the same thing 
with you and with me and with our lives. It's those little things, those little disciplines, those little daily disciplines. It's a little cycle. Like um, you waking up at 4.30 in the morning. Like me waking like up as at a ritual, you know. That's one of them. You know, I try and do something physically active every day. That's another thing. When you yeah. lose that discipline, what goes next? The next thing the on next the list, thing on really, the list. yeah. And then, and then the next thing, you know, you're sleeping in until nine, you're knocking your work done, and things are going horribly backwards. Mm-hmm. But it's those little disciplines. Yeah. And, and whenever I feel myself start to slip, I always think of this. I always think of the fact that there's these little disciplines that mean so much, yeah, and know, they build on each other. The, and what's interesting is I didn't, I didn't really look at it that way ever, and that makes complete sense, where, yeah, you let the little things slide and slowly by slowly those things that you let slide start getting bigger and bigger. I always thought of it where I remember hearing somebody say, if you can't make your bed right, right, then how do you expect to run a company? I think it was, how do you expect to be the boss of a company? And I I remember thinking, well, unless your company is a bed making company (laughs) that has nothing to do with it. And this is also a little bit counter to something I've heard recently when they talk about, have you heard this decision fatigue? Have you heard that? Not so, that expression, So it's basically no. this theory where every decision you make mm-hmm. takes some sort of toll on you mentally. Yes, yes. And okay. so you should, you should not fatigue your, your decisions. You should only, you should save your decisions for important things. So for instance. Is that kind of like if you're with a group of people and one, one guy says, hey, where do you guys want to eat? And everyone says, oh, I don't care. Where do <laughs> no, you want to eat? It's different. No, it's the same thing. It will, it's the same thing, maybe but on a is. way lower level. But, but the level that this, when I heard about the decision fatigue, the level that I heard this on was uh, like you, you, every day, you, don't, you shouldn't think about what you're going to wear that day. You should have your clothes ready because if you wake up, you have to think, oh, do I wear the blue shirt or the white shirt? And, and then it becomes decision. And then you decide, oh, what am I going to have for breakfast? May I have this or may I have that? And each one of these decisions chip away. Now, now, that's fine. I, I don't really, I don't know if I believe that 100%. But one thing I do think is the opposite is I think that the smaller disciplines instill and create stronger disciplines. So mm-hmm. the waking up early, the making of the bed, the, the checking off your list, the, all those little things that you do, I think increase discipline. I know what you, when I fall off the discipline wagon for whatever reason, it's like a, it's like a train wreck, you know, I'm like, Oh God, what just happened? I'm all of a sudden my room is a mess and my, it, it just goes downhill in three days and two days. And I go, Oh my God, get back in the game. Mm-hmm. So, and then as soon as I get back in the game and I implement those smaller disciplines, boom, we're back in the game and, and the, and the bigger disciplines fall into place. Mm-hmm. So continue. Now, there was a general that had swung through Vietnam, General James Woolno, and he observed, and this is going to the book, General James Woolno observed and wrote to the chief, to chief of staff Westmoreland, we all knew who that is, less than a month before, so before this had, he had showed up, before Hackworth had showed up, this guy, General... James Woolno had observed and wrote to Chief of Staff Westmoreland less than a month before during his whirlwind nine-day trip to the war zone. Woolno told the chief that the most that the almost universal opinion among those he'd spoken with was that the young officers and enlisted men being sent to Vietnam were indeed properly trained, prepared for combat, both by training and mental conditioning. So this guy wrote this flowery report after he goes, goes to Vietnam for nine days. And you can imagine somebody like Hackworth that spent five years in Vietnam. Somebody shows up, spends nine days there. He's looking at this guy like he's an idiot. Yeah. And this is a, a classic um, statement about leadership. He said, this is Hackworth going directly to the book again. What a mistake it was to listen to the generals of corporate HQ who were briefed only in zero defect terms and so far from the cutting edge expected nothing less. It was among the biggest mistakes of the war. The politicians only listened to these generals and these generals to themselves. That's, that's crazy. 
And this is again, when I was talking about questioning earlier, and like I question Hackworth and I question everybody and everything, I'm constantly asking those questions because you don't know. You don't know if you're just listening to the generals that are only listening to themselves. Mm. Back to the book. Few people ask the frontline soldiers, the only ones who really knew. So you got to talk to your frontline troops. Yeah. That's just a mandatory piece of leadership. Uh, I liked, I had a great word on this. It's called incestual knowledge, right? <laughs> when, the, when this little group just talks among themselves and they believe everything that they hear and they, and they agree with everything they hear. And you know where we see this? We see this and we saw it with mixed martial arts mm -hmm. because you saw guys that got so into their own little thing with no outside influence that when they all believed their own crap. Yeah, so jiu-jitsu can be too fully. It, it, it can be that way. Mm -hmm. And you got to have an open mind with everything, you know. Um, and definitely jiu-jitsu is one of the things you got to have an open mind with and see what other people are doing and how mm -hmm. are they doing it. And that's, that's the miracle these days is you can be seeing, getting all this influence from the internet. There's mm -hmm. all of these different people out there and showing how they're doing it and it's, it's a whole new world. Mm -hmm. But you got to have an open mind. If you have no, don't have an open mind and all you do is incestuously converse with other people that believe the same thing as you, mm -hmm. you're wrong. <laughs> um, and this is crazy. This is, this is again, this is what uh, we'll know says what is left and he's talking about the this vietnam what is left appears to be a mopping up operation i do not believe that in the current situation the enemy has the capability to more than harass us i did not find a division commander who disagreed with this conclusion with respect to his own tactical area of operation this is 1968 mm. and this general's coming back saying hey the enemy can't do anything but harass us <laughs> And that's this. This guy was the ranking guy going in back and reporting to Westmoreland, mm. in charge of the whole army. Mm. Crazy, crazy that this could be taking place. As we go a little bit deeper into this, they had a board that explained it was like a scoreboard for how many VC, Viet Cong, how many of them had been killed or mm. wounded, and how many Americans had been killed or wounded. And when he took over, when, when Hackworth took over, the enemy had zero KIA. So th there'd been zero enemy killed, mm -hmm. zero enemy wounded, and zero enemy captured. Meanwhile, the Americans had had 24 killed and 485 wounded. Mm -hmm. so, so did you hear what I just said? I did. <laughs> so the enemy had zero killed, zero wounded, zero captured. Mm-hmm. And yet we had lost 24 Americans killed and 485 wounded. This goes back to what I was talking about where I would see these similarities in Iraq to Vietnam because these wounded came from rockets, mortars, booby traps, friendly fire. Mm. Rockets, mortars, booby traps, and friendly fires. I think 70% of the casualties in Iraq were from IEDs. Mm. which an IED is an improvised explosive device, that's a booby trap. Right. You know, the other big percentage was from getting mortared, you know, mm. where you're sitting inside your fire base and all of a sudden bombs start raining down from the sky. Right. And it's weird too, like this is something that we talk about often. It's something that, that Hackworth talked about as well, is if you ever heard someone say, in Vietnam, we won every major battle, but we just lost the war. Have you ever heard that? It, no, it was a, it's a it's a statement that pe some people make and as i started to analyze that because I, when i was younger i was like yeah that's right because we're the best military in the world we would never lose to these guys we're awesome and, and we are awesome and we are the best military in the world but if i have a platoon of you know 40 guys in the army and we lose a guy to a booby trap and we lose a guy to a mortar, and we, and we never confront the enemy, well, who's going to win the war? It's not us. Right. So that was very, uh, very disturbing. And we did see some of this. We did see some of this in Iraq where things would get sugar-coated. 
Mm. And that's one thing I'd go back to the book and I'd say, why are they sugarcoating this? What's going on? Somebody needs to speak the truth. You know, mm. we need to tell them what's really going on here. Hey, I'd raise my hand and say, no, boss, it's not like that. We, we need this. We need, we're, this is where we're going to lose. This is what's going wrong. And luckily we had some very strong, you know, mil- military leaders that did that, you know, uh, Petraeus for sure, who kind of implemented the surge. We had, uh, McMaster, who I talk about a lot, H.R. McMaster up in, uh, up in northern Iraq. And, you know, the guy that I work directly for, Colonel Sean McFarland, who's now a general. Mm. Uh, he, those guys were guys that spoke the truth. And I would hear, I heard McFarland do that. I would hear that guy say, no, actually, we can't do that. No, that's actually the wrong idea. Mm. No, we actually need to engage with these tribal leaders, even though they were criminals six months ago. No, this is what we need to do. So mm. I got to see some of that leadership step up. Which was which was awesome. Uh, he goes on to talk about how <laughs> I got to read this. So he goes to what's called a change of command, which is when you know I'm in charge, but I'm going to give you the battalion. Gotcha. So the following day, I took over the battalion from Lieutenant Colonel Franklin A. Hart in a parade field change of command in the middle of the Mekong Delta. What kind of war have I gotten myself into, I wondered. A perfectly starched General Ewell was there, having flown in for the occasion in his polished choppers. There were, there were other brass too, and photographers, the American flag, but the battalion colors, which were ceremoniously passed on to me. And all of this before the scroungiest, most spiritless assembly of soldiers I'd ever seen. Incredibly, none of the generals or colonels seemed to notice the slack condition of my new charges or their positions. Lieutenant Colonel Frank Hart would still receive a legion of merit for his job well done with the battalion. So picture that in your mind. You're taking over this battalion. These guys are just complete disaster. The generals show up in their polished helicopters wearing starched uniforms, and they don't even, they just ignore. It's like they're like got blinders on. They're just ignoring the fact that these guys are just a total disaster. Crazy thoughts. Crazy thoughts. So, um, then we get into the point where, and this is where, when we, when we get these questions on Twitter about leadership, and this is sort of what drew, drew me back to thinking about, talking about this book, mm-hmm. was because as we get these questions, you end up with a, with a, just really great examples. And, and a lot of the questions that we get are, um, you know, what do you do with people that are unmotivated? What do you do when, you know, and, and everyone has that question of what do you do when people are unmotivated? Mm-hmm. And I, I'll tell you, can you imagine if there's anyone less motivated than a, you know, a conscript, a draftee from mm-hmm. Vietnam, from the Vietnam War? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, no problem. Uh, One of the things that Hack says is, little could I have guessed that whipping it into shape, meaning the battalion, would require every little bit bit of knowledge I'd gained in in the interim. So his whole career, he realized his whole career, he's gonna have to take every trick that he'd learned to get these guys into shape. Now, what's interesting about this is, he says whipping these guys into shape. And this is something I've had I've had executives when I get on, get on with the CEO and he'll say, I need you to come in here and whip my guys into shape. Right. And, and it's always, it's one of those quotes that I, I have to push back on because they think I'm going to come in there like a drill instructor and yeah. bark orders and people are going to, and it just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And you know, you, you have to do, you have to do more than that. So when one of the initial things that he did was institute discipline. And as you know, discipline is one of my favorite words. <laughs> Going back to the book here. From the outset, I realized to, that to make this unit an effective military force, I'd have to implement about a thousand changes. So I'd figured we'd start with five a day, little things, basic things, like wear your steel pot helmet. 
and clean and carry your rifle at all times. And ammunition will not be worn Poncho Villa style. My first order was that come darkness, the fire support base perimeter would pull back 300 meters. The troops instantly began to grumble at this. But at the next order, but it was the next order that really began the mutinous feeling within my hard luck outfit. Anything you can't carry 24 hours a day is gone on the next chopper. So here are these guys that were living in tents that had toilets out there, mm -hmm. radios and all this stuff. And he said, anything you can't carry with you, you just going, is out of here. Mm. That's hardcore discipline. And they piled it all up in the middle of the, uh, <laughs> the middle of the base and had a big helicopter come in and take it out. Now, one thing he says here is he says, I wasn't there to have them like me. And this is one of those dichotomies where, and I'm sure everybody at one point or another who has worked for someone that is very abrasive and thinks they can just throw orders around and, and, and no one likes working for that guy. It's, it's awful. Yeah. And so there's a fine line between, listen, I'm not here to make friends and oh, I'm just going to be totally abrasive and treat everyone like crap because you're not going to get people to follow you with that attitude. Yeah. So he obviously was very good at walking that fine line between pushing hard enough where he's like, hey, I'm not here to make friends, but at the same time, not pushing him so hard that he's getting shot or there, there's a complete mutiny against him. Yeah, you'd think that someone who... who in my experience, when people say that I'm not here to make friends, you know, I'm here to whatever. It's usually kind of like an excuse because they piss somebody off. Yeah. So I think that to really use that in a, in a, in a, in an accurate way or in a, in a conducive way, I'm not here to make friends is if you can show them results and at the same time, not necessarily, you know, be the nicest of guys, then I think that's when you start to walk that fine line. So, know? so it's beautiful that you said that. So this, this goes right into the fact that uh, a short time later, so after they pulled back this perimeter, mm -hmm. so every night, instead of staying where they were, just all relaxed, they packed up, they pulled back, they dug in. A short time later, we were hit with a barrage of rocket and recoilless rifle fire, but most of it fell on the old positions. When I got on the horn and called for artillery, I was surprised I was very nervous. Command is not like hopping back onto a bicycle. And after two and a half years away from it, I was rusty and actually scared I'd screw up. But then I heard a guy, later do I be identified as Lieutenant Larry Toller, who worked in the S3 section, running behind me to his defensive position. And here's the quote from this guy. He's a mean son of a bitch, but he knows what he's doing. So that's exactly what you just said. And that's exactly what effect it had um now moving through this the men and now he's talking about this unit the 439 the men of the 439 had no unit identity and no pride in themselves so for all those people that are out there that have sent me twitter questions saying hey how do i deal with people that are unmotivated how do i you know how do i change there's another one how does culture change uh He's going to go into that. As a first step toward rectifying this, I decided to call my hard luck battalion the Hardcore and the troops Recondos. So he's renaming them. Mm -hmm. He's renaming, renaming the battalion. And I actually did this very thing when I was a task unit commander, when I took over a task unit. So task units in a SEAL team, they have a, a phonetic letter for their name. So mm -hmm. there's Al Task Unit Alpha, Task Unit Bravo, Task Unit Charlie, mm -hmm. and then you've got the platoons underneath them. So what I did with ours is basically as soon as I took it over, I said, hey, we were Task Unit Bravo, B. Mm -hmm. And I said, guys, we're not Task Unit Bravo. We're Task Unit Bruiser. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those things where even though at first people were kind of, you know, what's this all about? Mm -hmm. but, then, but then after a little while, they're like, oh, no, 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 because you're in a Task Unit. I'm in task unit bruiser. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it really does have a, a legit effect. It's like a little psychological sense of pride. Like we're this, this unique kind of almost elite group just in that small little psychological way. Yeah. And 
yeah, I think branding a lot of, that has a lot to do with branding where, or, where, um, you get like a company, for example, um, you do just little things different and include everyone, right. whether it be the name, whether it be little, I mean, sometimes they do it with, um, like team building exercises, oh, for sure. For sure. which I've seen a lot of ones that, 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 that don't really, they're not very effective, but there's certain things that if, if those activities can kind of invoke a sense of pride and you guys are doing it together, that's when, that's when that can work. And the name thing, it's crazy how that's such a big thing it when is. you're a little bit, when you have a cool name where like, it's almost like a gang mentality. It is. And I mean, he literally says here, they had no unit identity. So Mm -hmm. guess what? He's going to pick that identity, Mm -hmm. call him the hardcore, call him the Rakondo. Mm -hmm. He's going to give them that identity and give them something to latch onto. Mm -hmm. And he goes even further. So he talks about how in the past when he was in with another unit, they had this greeting between officers and enlisted guys. And the, the officer would say airborne and the enlisted guy would say all the way. So the airborne all the way. Mm -hmm. And so now these guys are in Vietnam and it's a little bit different. It's a little bit harder. So now, and this is going back to the book, when a soldier saluted an officer, he said, hardcore Rakondo, sir. And when the officer responded, it was with a heartfelt, no fucking slack. <laughs> and I mean, it, it doesn't get any better than that. And as a matter of fact, when this is, this is one of the most fired up things, uh, when I, when I retired from the SEAL teams, the guys that ran the land warfare training, so like the most miserable, hard training out in the Imperial Valley of California where it's 120 degrees and you're humping through the desert and it's just completely hardcore. And we would, I mean, the training was miserable and tough and realistic and badass. And when I left, those guys from the land warfare group uh, gave me a shotgun and on the shotgun was engraved no fucking slack. <laughs> so, so you picture these guys walking around. It's like you just said, you're talking about unit identity and they give them this name, but now they're walking around and every time they see each other, they're saying hardcore Rakondo, no fucking slack. Mm-hmm. And I don't care. That's a mantra. Mm-hmm. You know, that becomes a mantra. That becomes what you say. And that doesn't take much for what you say to start to become what you believe. <laughs> yeah. And so I love that. I love, and when we work with companies, we, you know, depending on how long we're working with them for, we'll sit down and, and we'll have them come up with a mission statement. Yeah. And then we'll come up with some kind of a mantra and I'll tell them this story about no fucking slack. And you know, like what is going to make you, what is going to make you think that way? Mm-hmm. Cause that's what I used to say at land warfare. You know, when I was running land warfare training, you know, Hey, should we give these guys a little extra time? Should we give them the, should we move the target a little bit closer to the insert point? Are these, can we make this a little bit easier for them? And I'd say, no fucking slack. <laughs> and the reason was I wanted these guys to be ready. I wanted every one of those SEALs that was going to Iraq and Afghanistan to be ready for anything to be ready. I wanted the training to be harder than real combat. That was the goal. And then these these little mantras and, and all these things, that kind of gives everyone a sense of pride in going through that hard training to, oh, for sure. to ultimately result in being ready. Right. So... For them to to take pride and enjoyment in that hard training because of these little tiny things, uh, that makes it just that much more effective. Yeah. You know the yeah. whole the whole situation. It, it's it's completely true. Um, there's another piece here. Simultaneously, going back to the book. Simultaneously, I started establishing standard operating procedures that would not only keep the troops alive, but also give them for the first time. The feeling they were in charge of the situation, not at mercy of the VC or insidious booby traps. So think about that, you know, this, this idea that you're on the defense all the time and you're constantly like waiting to get blown up or waiting to get mortared or waiting to get a, take a sniper round. That's a horrible, horrible feeling. Being on the receiving end of that stuff is horrible because you don't have control over it. Mm -hmm. So then they started slowly putting things together to to go on the offensive. So standard operating procedures included such things as every officer having to read Mao's Little Red Book. So this was kind of the communist way. Mm -hmm. And he wanted all the officers to know and understand that. Mm -hmm. Because how can you beat an enemy if you don't know what they're thinking? That was another just classic move. You gotta think like the enemy. 
I got a couple more things to pull out here. People talking about, um, you know, caring for your guys. And here's another good, you know, I, this is going back to the book. I wasn't going to lose any legs for a couple VC. I was into fighting hard, but not at the expense of bleeding troops. The fact that I had, that I walked with the platoons put me in the good graces of a lot of men, but my stock rose even faster when they got word, when word got around that I wasn't a butcher. So even though he was hardcore and he was saying no fucking slack, what he, what he talks about earlier in that paragraph is if he found one of the young officers was doing something that was careless, that could put guys at risk of running into booby traps or and that what that didn't have a good return, he'd fire that guy. He mm-hmm. would literally just fire the guy. And that be, and so the guys realized, oh, okay, this guy's hardcore, but guess what? He cares about us. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that is huge. Mm-hmm. And, and, Another piece, and this is kind of going back to what we just said. All the 439 really needed, had, need, had really needed, was a good kick in the ass, which included creating or bringing in leaders who cared for their men and giving the men some sense of real purpose. Mm-hmm. Wow. <laughs> wow. You know, and what we call that, and what Leif and I talk about in the book, it's the why. Why are we here? Mm-hmm. And you would be surprised. It happens with companies. It happens with families. It happens in the military. It happens with teams. They don't understand why they're doing what they're doing. They're just doing it as a task, as a robot. Mm-hmm. And you can't treat people like robot. People have to have some kind of long-term goal. They have to have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So when that's, that's like 99% of my answers. When somebody says, hey, I've got this problem where these people don't want to follow this rule. They don't want to do this safety uh, task or safety procedure. Mm. They, you know, I can't get my guys to do the safety procedure. And I'm like, well, do they understand why they're doing it? Mm-hmm. Well, what do you mean? Do they understand why they are doing it? Do they understand why they are supposed to clip in at the end, top of a tower that they're climbing? Do they understand why? Do they understand the implications if they fall? Do they understand the implications not just to them, but to their family? Are they thinking about the implications to their job? Are they thinking about the implications to the company and then mm-hmm. other people's jobs? You put all those why, here's why you're clipping into that tower. Because yeah, if yeah. you fall, you can't pay your mortgage. Your kids you know, can't eat. Then on top of that, we have to shut down the tower for a week. We're going to lose money. We're going to lose jobs. And, and when you think about why, then all of a sudden the guy goes, okay, I guess I'll clip in. Right. <laughs> well, yeah. It's one of those things. So that idea of understanding why is just extremely important. And uh, to close out this, this section on you know about face which again depending on i don't know this may be maybe this was just a um an exercise in my own <laughs> in my own uh what is it what is that word selfishness to be able to talk <laughs> about this with people and, and have them here mm-hmm. and and for me to go through this book again again i learn every time i read it but to mm-hmm. kind of wrap it up so he goes on and they go on, this is a, a long chapter, and they go on to talk about all these different things that they did. And they did turn the fight, and they did start to kill the enemy, and they did start to spare their own guys, and they, they started fighting the guerrillas like they were guerrillas. So he really implemented all those things that they had talked about. Mm-hmm. So now he's getting ready to leave, and he says, uh, the hardcore battalion proved to me everything I'd ruminated on throughout the two years that went before. All those ideas and theories on how to fight the G, and the G is guerrillas. Mm-hmm. If there was satisfaction in that, there was much less in the fact that my success didn't make a dent in the way the war was prosecuted. So even though he did a great job and it really changed their battlefield for him, mm-hmm. other people didn't say, oh, I see what they're doing. I'm going to do that too. Mm-hmm. Ironically, what did was the debacle of Hamburger Hill, where Screaming Eagle... General Melvin Zace ordered 11 assaults up an extremely well-fortified, totally, use, totally useless piece of real estate as if, he thought, as if he thought he was in Korea or storming kraut positions at Normandy. Almost 400 American men dead or wounded later, the 101 unit was king of the mountain. But within a week, the objective was abandoned. 
So I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but Hamburger Hill was a huge deal. Lost 400 guys, wounded or dead, held it for a week, and then left. Mm -hmm. The ensuing horrified uproar among American people and in Washington made sure Hamburger Hill was the last huge and costly battle fought by an American troops in Vietnam. So I guess if no one learned how to fight the war from me and the men of the hardcore, at least from General Zeiss, they finally learned how not to. But we were already four years into the war and there were almost four more to go. Tough. So that's about face for you. <laughs> that, is a, uh, that is a heavy book, figuratively and literally. And, mm. you know, again, depending on uh, what people thought of that, maybe we'll come back to it and talk about it again in the future. That book and those experiences are kind of where this comes from, this mindset and the attitude that I have. That How is, much of it do you think? I don't, I couldn't sit here and put a percentage on it. Um, from a leadership, from a combat leadership perspective, it is a, it is a pretty significant amount. You mm -hmm. know, it's probably in the, in the 20 or 30% of confirming things that I believed, learning new things, seeing things and reading about them and then watching them happen and, and understanding them. So that it definitely is a, is a significant portion of some kind. Yeah. Meanwhile. Meanwhile on the internet. On the interwebs, we got a bunch of uh, great questions. A bunch, I mean, we got hundreds of, hundreds of great questions. And obviously, we can't answer them all. So some of them we kind of compiled together. Some of them we pulled out. And you know what I did not do is I did not put the names of the people that submitted them. So next time, I will do that. I think we got one person that, that recommended that. So I apologize for everyone out there on Twitter and Facebook that submitted questions. And we used them. Next time, I'll, I'll try and get your name in there so we, you'll know that I am talking to you. <laughs> but, uh, but we've got some great feedback and comments and all that. So let's, uh, let's dive into some of these. Okay, so mental toughness. We're going back to this. I think this is important, mental toughness, because I think this is one of those things that's a constant endeavor for I would, I would argue for everybody. I would agree. In, in one way or another. Absolutely. <clears throat> and, that, and this question is really appropriate. Mental toughness is not just one thing. Some people are tough in the gym or in fights, but weak when their wife leaves them, for example. Do you agree with that? And, and this guy, and again, I wish I had, whoever you are, I apologize, because he actually makes a statement. This is a statement. Mm -hmm. Mental toughness is not one thing. Mm -hmm. And then he quantifies that statement by saying some people are tough in the gym, or in fights, but weak when their live when their wives leaves them. Mm -hmm. He says, "Do you agree?" Well, I agree a hundred percent. And this opens up a whole spectrum of reality, and that is that these that that what is it that crushes a person? Because it's different for everybody. Everybody has this thing, this weakness that maybe it never gets uncovered. Maybe yeah. it does. And the fact that he's talking about, you know, fighters and saying that people are tough in, in the gym, they're tough in fights, but they have some weakness that can crush them. I think we've seen that plenty. I mean, just famous people, famous fighters that this has happened to, John Bones Jones. I mean, obviously the guy's an animal in fights, He's an animal training in the gym, but he has some mental weaknesses that he needs to overcome and that hopefully he will be able to so he can reach his full potential. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I hope he does, but you know, he's lucky he's got a good support base around him and he's got money to, to try and solve these problems because there's a lot of people that end up with those weaknesses or have those weaknesses and ends up crushing them. Mm -hmm. And that's scary. And I'll tell you what the scariest thing is. 
And I think this is a great lesson and it's something that I learned over and over again. And I don't know when it exactly solidified in my brain, but it's so disturbing and bizarre when you see somebody that you care about and you watch them go down this spiral and it's so obvious what they have to do to stop it, to stop the downward spiral. It's like, oh, uh, get rid of that girl or right. get, stop using that drug or stop drinking or do whatever the case may be, whatever that thing that's got them. And you're clearly telling them to stop it mm-hmm. and they don't. Yeah, because, I mean, and I think I, 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 think I know what your point is going to be here, but I when you say it's point. clearly obvious, it's clearly obvious kind of, a way to put it is it's clearly obvious on paper. Where you could point it out and that person, the person you care about, he, she, whatever, they would probably agree with you. And you say, oh, is this holding you back, you think? Or is this jamming you up? And they'd probably say, yeah. But to be like, oh, just simply let it go. Let's say it was a girl. Let's say, I don't know, uh, yeah, oh, a good girlfriend no. or something like that. Yeah. Um, and you're like, yeah, the girl's jamming me up. She's or not a guy, let's be fair. Or, like or a, a guy, guy. whatever. Um, and, you know, it's as simple as that. Get rid of the girl. But... I think, and everybody's different. There's a certain need that someone has, an inherent need that Th- that's that, exactly. that girl is fulfilling, and that need is big. No matter how deep down it is, it's a big need. Obviously, that they're letting that need get fulfilled in in at the expense of their goals, their training, their whatever. So, it's not that easy. It's obvious, sure, but it's just not that easy to be like, oh, let's just get rid of the girl. I didn't say it was easy, right? So, but I know you've seen this. I think we've all seen this where you're looking at a situation with someone that you truly care about and you want to help them and you could write down in two sentences what they have to do to completely resurrect and change their life. Mm-hmm. And, it's as, and it is as easy as getting rid of a girl or a guy that's in their life that's a disaster or it's as easy as stopping the use of drugs and alcohol or it's as easy as cutting sugar out of your diet because you're sick from it or it's as easy as working out a certain methodology to get you through this situation so it's 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 horrible and it's one of those things that's for me it's taught me to again i talk about detachment a lot detach from myself to make sure I'm not that guy that doesn't have some issue that's holding me back. And right. like I could be doing better if I would get, if I would take that input from other people or even better off if I could detach and see that input myself and wow. self correct. Yeah. But and, and you, when you can see it in someone else, that's really what you, what the dynamics of that relationship is. Meaning let's say, you know, your friend has yeah, something, a girl, for example, holding him back. It's easy for you to say, oh, just do this. Here's the two sentences. This is all you got to do. Get rid of the girl. Be happy. That's it. It's easy because you are detached. detached. Yeah, absolutely. So the hard part is for him to actually detach. But if he can detach, look in, he'd be essentially in the same position as you and probably be able to at least be on his way to do it. Exactly. It's weird, though. And that's why I say people are crazy. <laughs> like we do crazy yeah, things. Yeah. We make big mistakes. We get emotional. We do things that are crazy. Human beings do it. Mm-hmm. And that's very, very difficult to deal with. And, and it's really, uh, it can be very sad to see, you know, I've seen people with great, unbelievable <clears throat> potential that have for all practical purposes, cast it away for some ridiculous reason that again, If they would have followed two bullet points on a piece of paper that said, get rid of this girl and stop using this drug, their Mm -hmm. life would be different and you just, you can't help them. Yeah. And obviously, you know, getting rid of a girl, um, that's clearly just an example. It's not, we're not saying girls are any sort of a problem. We've seen the same thing with girls and guys, you know, girls that date this guy that's a disaster that drags them down whatever. Yeah. And it could be either one. We should just say relationships and that being fair. Yeah. Toxic relationship. Yeah, toxic but, relationship. Um, I don't know. I mean, you use the word ridiculous, which, uh, you know, cool, but I don't think it is really ridiculous because if you kind of, if you break it down, I think, like I said, they have a certain need that isn't obvious to everyone, you know, everyone aside, even to them, it might not be obvious, but they have a need in there that this, t- 
toxic relationship is fulfilling. It's jamming up a bunch of other things in their life or their goals, but it is fulfilling this little thing that they need. Well, okay, you can say that. Uh, that's that's, uh, that's but fine. That makes I'm sense, not gonna, though. I'm right? not going to argue with you. That's the that's the root of the problem, though. <laughs> right, but if if that need is if basically the 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 sum of that need or the 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 size of if that the need size is that bigger need, than the need of them achieving those goals, which yeah. may seem weird because it's like, oh, that teeny tiny need to be loved or accepted is bigger than being a champion of the world. Or be, it seems weird, but from an individual standpoint, on the in, how they feel on the inside, that need, in a lot of times, is bigger. Yeah, and that's what's crazy, which is why yeah. I said people are crazy. <laughs> Because they, make, they make that injured. determination. Yeah. And, and you can't help them. That's the piece. You cannot help them. Yeah. So, you can try. You can paint it out yeah. for them. You can tell them a thousand times, a thousand different ways. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think you could, Yeah. I think there are ways to help. Obviously, I think it's like through like a therapy type of situation. Not necessarily like a professional therapy, maybe, but not necessarily. Or something really impactful. Well, yeah. I always hear, you know, you always hear it's got to be the rock bottom (laughs) the person's got to hit rock bottom somehow and then they realize oh okay i've destroyed my life now i'll start moving again and you just wish you could help them before they hit rock bottom i was talking about this today with uh with greg hitting rock bottom and Uh the reason that it's typically and i don't want i'll just use the word easier it's easier to move forward when you hit rock bottom is because you're not you can't go any further deeper but what that i mean that sounds obvious but what that means is you're here right at the bottom. If below here is unacceptable, it's death or it's, you know, I don't know, jail. I don't know, whatever, whatever your rock bottom is. So you can never justify, oh, I've been doing it this way and I'm still here. You can never make that justification at rock bottom because I've been doing it this way and I'm here. That's unacceptable. You're at rock bottom. But let's say you're not at rock bottom, but you're pretty junk. You're, you're not Mm-hmm. doing good but you're making it you're handling it sure your job sucks but i'm still here you know i still got my car yeah so they're so, able know. to justify yes yeah, so yeah, when they okay look, i need to make an improvement i'm gonna start i'm gonna start on monday i'm gonna i'm gonna make an improvement so they start on monday okay it goes good tuesday mm, goes good wednesday some temptation comes and whatever the drugs or drinking whatever when they're kind of exhausted from putting in that effort to change and it's like, okay, I'll just have one beer. Okay, I'll just, okay, I'll just start drinking again because, hey, really, I'm, I'm cool with it. You know, I, I, I've, I made it. It's not they've all accepted, that bad. They've accepted their station in life. Right. And, and when somebody accepts their station in life, then I guess they're not going to be motivated to do anything. Right. So, and that accepting their station is essentially their justification right. for relapsing. But when you're at rock bottom, you can't do that. So, I mean, obviously people's rock bottom are different, like I said, but um, that's the reason. That it's that it's easier. I know it sounds crazy, but it's easier to move forward when you're at rock bottom. It's tough stuff. So, um, yeah, mental toughness. Yeah, uh, like how you said, it is. Um, it's different for everyone, and you can be. Men- it's not an across the board thing. You're right. just mentally tough. Yeah, and you know? but to tie this back into mental toughness is again going back to detachment. You know, I'm, I'm glad where most of the people listening to this aren't dealing with a situation where they've got some grievous scenario going on and their life is on a downward spiral hopefully your downward spiral is that you slept in until 5 30 you know that's that's the type of thing where you want to catch yourself and like we talked about earlier you want to get those little disciplines in place and and build upon those and become better yeah stay out of the never mind the rock bottom let's get to the top of this bad boy that's what i'm talking about yeah and it and with that i think this might be kind of obvious but it's important to recognize what elements or what aspects of your life that you are not quite as tough mentally at you know like if if, you know if you have a weakness for beer and alcohol then recognize that or i have a weakness for giving up when i start to get tired in training or something like that um you know recognize that yeah and uh here's a quick story for you it's an important story echo charles Uh, with a story christmas eve um i went to the store just real quick and it was real crowded, the supermarket, right? So I go and I get two 12-packs of beer and some tomatoes. And I have a cart, not or I have a basket, not a cart. So I'm carrying it. 
So all the lines are long. So I'm, st so I'm standing in one of the lines and, um, and I'm holding the basket with the 12 pack of beer in one hand with the tomatoes and the other 12 pack of beer in the other hand. So it's, that's, you know, it's not like terribly heavy, but it can get heavy after a little while. So the line's real long. So I'm going to be in that line for a while. So after a while, you know, your shoulders start getting tired. And right then I recognize, okay, he, this can be a small exercise in mental toughness. Just a small one. <laughs> not a, you know, not a marathon or nothing like that. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm gonna just going to hold these until, yeah. until I put them on the thing. I'm not going to put them down because right now I, I kind of want to put them down. So what I did is I made it, consciously made it an exercise. So okay. I held them and... Every little thing that would happen, this guy's not taking um, or this guy's not being as quick as he should be. Mm -hmm. Boom, that, that's another element added to the mental toughness exercise. Right. No. Somebody's going to write a check. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So I did it. I totally did it. It took maybe, I would say, 10 minutes, a good 10 minutes of just holding it. You know. Um, so I put my, my, uh, my stuff on the, on the little carousel or whatever to get it checked out. And I remember thinking, okay, that's one little exercise in mental toughness a little workout in me mental toughness done now i realize as a demonstration of mental toughness that's quite lame <laughs> but as far as recognizing yeah. a potential situation where you could be mentally weak using it as an exercise to be to help with mental toughness as a concept that's an important element and you know what i like the best about that whole story was the fact that you had to mentally detach yourself and recognize because that's the true exercise in my mind is having the ability to be outside yourself and look at yourself and say, you're being weak right now or yes. here's an opportunity. Yes. That's real triumph yes. on a small scale. Yeah. With it, beer it, 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 at the supermarket. <laughs> and tomatoes, yeah. But if you can just start thinking to yourself that way, that small little exercise can turn into a little bit bigger exercise right. and, and next thing you know you're in a detrimental situation recognizing hey if i can practice some toughness this. right now where you know a month ago two months ago i would have straight up gave up but let me use this as yet another exercise and it's a big detrimental situation look being lucky you mentally tough i like it at approved. least on your way yeah approved for sure barely approved but approved <laughs> nonetheless <laughs> Next question. Okay. Okay, next question is, my son, who's seven, seven years old, and I want to get into jujitsu. What lessons has it taught you in life? Well, you know, I talk about jujitsu all the time because I do think it's a great metaphor for life. Some of the things that it teaches you, without a doubt, is it teaches you humility because it's not going to teach you humility by telling you, hey, be humble, be humble. It's going to teach you humility because you are going to get submitted and be forced to surrender to people that are smaller than you, that are weaker than you, that aren't as good athletes as you. And that's going to happen on almost a daily basis yeah. when you first start out. Mm -hmm. So there's no doubt about that. It's going to teach you about respect. And I had a I had a buddy in the Marine Corps, uh, great dude, Big H. I know you're out there somewhere. And he was a, he was a badass. I mean, he looked like a superhero, super strong. Just and he and he grew up in, I think he grew up in Texas. He was some kind of a gang member in Texas. Had a rough childhood. And he was he was a badass, scary dude, super nice, but 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 definitely could bring it. And when he started training. After like a month, you know, I said, so, you know, what do you, what do you think of jujitsu? And he said, uh, you know, I used to think I was badass and now I don't want to mess with anybody mm -hmm. because I don't know if they've been training for three months mm -hmm. and if they have been, I'm in trouble. Yeah. So you definitely will learn respect from jujitsu. Mm -hmm. uh, discipline, you know, we, we were just kind of talking earlier and I was talking about training today and how I just did not feel like training today. I was all beat up. I was tired. I'm sore. 
And there's only one thing that got me on the map, and that's just having the discipline to get on there and know that I needed to train. So there's nobody, I don't care who you are, that feels like training every single day, seven days a week. But if you want to get better and you want to reach the goal, then you have to do it. And so it, it teaches you about discipline. And, and I would say from a mental perspective, one of the coolest things that jujitsu teaches you is it teaches you that maneuver and that tactics and that brains that those things trump strength and trump meeting force on force. And I talk about this all the time in psychological situations. And it's too bad. I wish everybody in the world trained jujitsu because you have all these metaphors that you could tell them. Mm -hmm. So it's great when I have a client that actually trains jujitsu because then I can, or understands MMA or watches martial arts or watches UFC because then you can use these examples. But you know, the classic case in the mental confrontation is people have a tendency to want to go, you know, fist on fist. Mm -hmm. And if you say one thing, if you say method A, I say method B, and we're just gonna bang those two methods together and see who, you know, a lot of times it's see who has more rank. Mm. And you know what, you know what, Echo? I'm in charge, so we're going with method right. B. Well, now you're gonna do what I say, but you're not gonna do it willingly, you're gonna sabotage it, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. That's not jujitsu. Jujitsu is is using maneuver and setting people up and and being more crafty that's what jujitsu is and that's how you win and that's how you win not just on the mat not just but in life as well and it's the same thing on the battlefield you know we we have a little saying in, the, uh, in combat he who flanks first wins meaning the person that gets around to the side and attacks from an unexpected direction is going to win mm -hmm. and it's the same thing in, in mentally in jujitsu and it's the same thing in in you know, mental confrontations with people. It's, it's who is going to maneuver. Mm -hmm. And it's always this indirect approach. That's the key phrase that I use when I'm dealing with someone that's not a jujitsu person. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about how do they deal with their boss that just does this or their subordinate that has a big head or whatever. I tell them, listen, you need to use an indirect approach because the direct approach is not gonna get through to this person. I was I have a, was doing some executive coaching the other day and had this guy, he explained the personality of this guy that worked for him. And the guy that had worked for him had been moved underneath him in a, in a reorganization. And it was one of those guys, he's a senior guy who he should have been a peer, but now all of a sudden he's reporting to him and he's been in the business for 32 years and he knows stuff better than I do. And then the guy says to me, so I've brought the guy in and I've told him I'm going to coach him and this is what I'm gonna help him with. And I said, okay, <laughs> you, you are no way is this guy going to accept that, that you're going to coach him. It's, it's his not in his personality. You can't go, whereas this guy that I was talking to, call him Mike, I said, Mike, you wanna be coached, you wanna be helped, you have an open mind. If I came to you and said, hey, I wanna coach you, you'd be like, that's great. This guy is the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. If I go to him and say, hey, I'm gonna coach you, he's gonna say, I don't need coaching. Right. And even if I outrank him and I say, no, I'm going to coach you, he's going to do it reluctantly and he's going to sabotage it and he's yeah. never going to put any effort into it. And right. he's going to actually do the opposite to prove you wrong. Right. Yeah. He's so insecure. Uh, that's the direct approach. Jiu-jitsu is the indirect approach. Yeah. So what you do with this guy when you're going to coach him is you say, listen, you know what I need is you're so much more experienced than this. I need some help running the organization. Can you come and help me get things in order and give me a hand straightening things out? And also, can you fill me in on what we can improve inside of our department? And when, when you do that, now all of a sudden he's starting to tell me what all the problems are and now I can discreetly and indirectly coach him on how we're gonna fix those problems. Mm -hmm. That's jujitsu. And that's one of the lessons you learn from it. Yeah. Yeah, and, and not to mention the, the sort of more obvious things where, you know, it's a great workout. You get, um, you know, kind of this, you know, men, actually just be all people, they have a sort of aggression kind of built into them. Mm -hmm. And it's a spectrum. Some people more mm -hmm. than others. Um, you can <laughs> engage. <laughs> I, I understand what you're trying to tell me. Yeah. <laughs> You can engage in jujitsu and be a pretty accurate simulation of 
whether it be a fight or any kind of aggressive combat situation and it still be safe and doable where you can do it again and again. You can go, you know, the next day. It's it's if you go spar, right, boxing, yeah, you yeah. can't really do it every day no. and you can't go all out. If you go all out and do it every day, you're going to get messed up. Yeah. In jiu-jitsu, you can, you can do that. And so you get that satisfaction when you when you leave and it's kind of strange because when you get the satisfaction from that, you kind of want to do it some more. Mm-hmm. You know, so most people, when you talk to people who have been doing it for over a year, talk to every, every, anyone you know that has been doing it more than one year, I would say my argument would be 85% or more will tell you that at some point they were addicted to it, yeah. that they would go to sleep at night and they'd be thinking about yeah. a move or something like that. And to go along with the things that you just, the obvious things, because you're yeah. right, there's some obvious things. Mm-hmm. The the workout, it's a great workout. You get more in tune with your own body. You learn how to handle yourself in a real fight. And and it does give you, absolutely gives you confidence. Mm-hmm. And confidence that you can handle a situation. Confidence that uh, that's coupled with the respect that you look at everyone and say, hey, you know what, this guy might be able to... Uh, this guy might know more than I do, so I'm going to respect him. But at the mm-hmm. same time, you know that hey, I'm going to be able to at least know what I'm doing very mm-hmm. confidently. So it, it helps out across the board, and it's definitely a a great sport. So with the new year approaching, what have you changed your mind about as, in, in, as in, far as 250, in two, 2015? Yeah. Well, the biggest uh, thing that's been a radical change, because I'm a... I always talk about how I have this big open mind and all that. But the fact of the matter is I, I'm very set in my ways and I kind of follow patterns and I, I believe things and, and my beliefs are open for, for changing, but a lot of times they just don't get changed. Mm -hmm. Uh, Okay, so one thing that's been radically different about me in 2015 and it's been kind of a bizarre ride is the fact that I am now out there in the world Mm -hmm. and you know people obviously when i made the decision with leif that we were going to write this book we knew that we were going to be out there and and people were going to know us now the book has been more successful than you know it's kind of been the max level of success that i thought it could achieve you know i thought there was a spectrum and and we definitely achieved a great success and we're we're super super happy about that but that means we're even more out there yeah than we thought we're going to be. Then on top of that, there's been this whole internet phenomenon right, right. of Get out there you know, on the, going on the, on the Tim Ferriss show with Tim and going on the Joe Rogan show with Joe and then doing this podcast and being on Twitter and all these things, being on Facebook. I mean, I did, literally did not have a Facebook account, literally did not have a Twitter account, never been on them before. And then now I have, you know, I'm on it and in it and communicating with people. And I think that's, you know, people would tell me like, hey, social media is cool. You can link up with other people. And I was definitely, I didn't want to link up with other people. <laughs> I didn't want to <laughs> have my friends and I didn't really want to make, meet other people. Yeah. But now that I'm there, it's awesome, honestly. It's awesome to have people all over the world. I have people all over the world, especially because, you know, I do the thing in the morning with my watch and at yeah. 4, 4.30 in the morning, I take a picture of my watch and I post it on Twitter. And I, I get those because other people do it. And, mm-hmm. and now my Twitter is filled with people from every time zone throughout the day that wake up at 4.30 in the morning and they get their workout on. Yeah. And that's, that's cool, man. That's yeah. very cool to see that there's other people in the world that have the same kind of mentality that want to be better, that want to improve, that want to do their best. And I think that's, uh, I think that's been pretty cool to see. And it's also been, it's, it's been, honestly, it almost makes me feel like I'm in a leadership position in a way (laughs) again, because I've got like people that are saying, Hey, thanks for putting this out there and thanks. And it it makes you feel just like, just like being in a leader combat leadership position where you feel humbled by these guys that are doing so well. Well, I feel the same way with these people. I'm humbled by the fact that these people are out there and they're communicating with me and talking to me and, and saying, I inspire them. And I always write back, man, you inspire me. Uh, You know, that inspires me that you're out 
you know, kicking ass. And, and there's these, you know, I always talk about like the single moms or the single dads that are out there. They're getting up earlier than me and they're going to work. Yeah. You know, and that's job number one and they're getting home late. So that's, that's inspiring to me. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I think it's been a pretty cool ride so far. Any other weird thing is I have no idea where the ride is going. <laughs> I do. I do not know. Yeah. You know, I'm all about plans and I'm a little bit of a control freak, but just to be out there and on this roller coaster, that you have no idea where it's going. So that's, that's pretty entertaining too. Yeah, to to connect with um, with people who have the same interests in you, and not all interests, obviously, but just some of the same interests yeah. as you. It is c- kind of refreshing because if you go just through your day to day life, right, and someone as extreme as you are, it's going to be hard to find someone to relate to in specific ways, or even right. in a general way. It's going to be harder for someone like you. Right. So when you get these little tidbits of people doing the same yeah. thing as you and it's like, dang, I'm, I'm relating to these people right. just in that small little way every day or however often you yeah. check your Twitter, yeah. you know, and it's kind of refreshing and it reminds you that there are people like that out there, yeah. you know, who want to wake up early and, and be disciplined and work hard and then face the day and get stuff done or whatever. Yeah. And you might not see that in your day to day life outside of the Internet, like in your in your right. real life. You might not see that. So you might have this feeling of, man, am I the only one who's trying to get this stuff done? You know, yeah. almost like that kind of thought. You're right. And, um, and I'm definitely not. Yeah. And, it's, and you're right. It is. It is reassuring. Yeah. And it's cool to communicate with these people. They're yeah. fired up. Got a bunch of firemen and police officers that yeah. are on there that are fired up every day bunch mm-hmm. of obviously a bunch of former military people yeah. but then you know because i have kind of a weird background i get these crazy old hardcore punk rock kids and I, you know they're communicating with me and right. it's just it's very interesting yeah it's very interesting it's been an interesting ride and like i'm i'm curious to see where it all ends up yeah yeah i do think that the more experience you have with people the more good stuff you can learn that that people have in them, regardless of stuff you might not agree with them. Yeah. But if you can find have more experiences with more people in whatever way, yeah. you'll be and, more informed and, about and how this, people are. And this this really the the fear or the rejection I had of social media was based on what I talked about earlier with that Tom Wolf uh, book, The Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test. Mm-hmm. Me, 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 me. And I always felt that social media was me, me. Here's a picture of me. Here's right. me doing this. Here's my food. And this is my car. And this is me, me, me. And it just felt so disturbing. Right. And, but now I, like you're saying, I realize that this, this social media, at least the way that I'm involved in it right now, it's not about me. It's about we, right. and there's a group of people that have the similar mindset, and some of them are more into it, some of them aren't, but they're mm-hmm. there, and they communicate with me, and it's not me, it's we, and I think that's, that's, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah, for sure. Well, it is everything. It, it's a spectrum, but I think, it, I think we all feel that, even if we're people who are really into the internet, really into Facebook, really into Twitter, um, and Instagram, if people overdo it me me here's a selfie of me in front of the mirror if if you see 10 pictures of of them taking a picture of themselves in front of the mirror that's a me 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 situation yeah. for sure <laughs> no but doubt. they're just on that side of the spectrum that's all yeah. there's yeah. there's yeah. all kinds of different people and i think the majority of people are in that we we category yeah sure it's something about me but there is, there is no we without me too yeah. you yeah. know no it's cool uh i don't like people that send me stuff on Twitter that I get pictures every day of people's watches. Yep. I get pictures of their jump rope or their kettlebell. Yeah, like yeah. no one sa- I don't know what any of these people look like, which I guess is kind of bizarre. Mm-hmm. And, but that's, you're right. They're not about me, me, me. They're about we and yeah. like having a little, uh, little group, little gang yep. to get after it. Yeah. I sent you one picture of me and like, it wasn't four 30. It was more like noon. <laughs> it's four 30 like in the afternoon. <laughs> Actually it was like 2 PM. Um, so your sleep, next question, your sleep routine, you get less than eight hours sleep yes. from what I know. Okay. So your sleep routine, how many hours of sleep do you get? And what are the techniques you used to get to sleep if you're not tired? You know, do you take naps? Do that? Does that work? Uh, okay. So I generally sleep, I try and sleep at least five, five and a half 
or six hours a night. It generally ends up being somewhere between five and five and a half, generally. Mm -hmm. I feel not good if I sleep for, you know, seven hours. I, I don't feel good. I feel mm -hmm. groggy. Gotcha. Uh, I don't know why that is. I, that's the way it is, though. I feel good. And I sometimes I feel better when I slept 4.5 hours, mm -hmm. otherwise known as four and a half hours. <laughs> sure. Uh, so, so there's no doubt that I don't need a ton of sleep. Um, that being said, sometimes I do feel tired. And sometimes, you know, come the afternoon, uh, especially if I have to do something boring or tedious. Mm -hmm. And that's when I'll feel really legitimately tired. If I'm up and moving, I don't need to sleep. I actually don't need to sleep. Like mm -hmm. I can go long periods of times without sleeping. If there's something actively engaging my mind, mm -hmm especially something that's got to be partially physical, you know, cause you sitting down reading a book when you're tired is, is tough. Mm. So, uh, I do and, and power naps are great. And this is something that I learned part of it in high school and part of it in basic SEAL training. When I was in high school, my anatomy and physiology teacher, I used to go in, walk by his room at lunchtime and he'd be in there with his feet up on the desk in like his chair all low. And he'd just be in there sitting, you know, doing a little bit of work. And one day I said, hey, you know, you look kind of relaxed in there. And he said, hey, this is a technique. And I said, what do you mean? He said, put your, when you, when you rest, elevate your feet above your heart. Because your, your veins are stressed out. You know, the one-way valves in your veins. You've got blood pooled up in areas in your feet. You want to get that stuff out of there. So elevate your feet above your heart. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. Then in SEAL training you'd come back from, let's say, breakfast in the morning or lunch, and you get back to the barracks and you have to grab gear to get ready for whatever the next evolution was gonna be. Well, they'd give you time to grab the gear, but they'd also give you time to you know, use the bathroom or, or whatever. And it would literally be, they'd say, all right, we gotta be back out here in eight minutes. Well, it'd take you one minute to get your gear done. So if I didn't have to go to the bathroom, I would go in my room, I would lay down on the floor, I'd put my feet up on the bed, and I would set my alarm clock for six minutes, mm. and I would get a power nap, and you'd fall asleep almost immediately because you're so tired. So you just fall asleep, six minutes later, boom, you wake up, and you feel refreshed, and you feel recharged. If you sleep for longer than that, sometimes you start to feel groggy again. So you gotta be mm. careful that you don't sleep for too long, but yeah, try the elevated feet above the heart, eight minute power nap when you're feeling tired and it'll make you feel better. You gotta set your alarm clock so you don't, so that eight minutes doesn't right. turn into two <laughs> hours. hours. <laughs> and, and that's it, you know, I, look, I know and probably, uh, I know I should probably sleep more and I would like to do that. I'll tr I try and do that sometimes. Um, but also my mind, it's, it's not like a big choice that I'm making, right. <laughs> you know? When when I'm thinking about something, it cannot be stopped. Yeah. <laughs> it, it cannot be stopped. Yeah. When I'm thinking about something, it just goes. And I, in my mind, it feels like I'm going down um, various tunnels of thought. Mm -hmm. That's literally what it feels like. I'm going down these various tunnels of thought, and one leads to another. I'm taking a left turn, right turn. I'm getting all these ideas, and I can't sleep. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. I and I would imagine that most, a lot of people are like that, where if they have a, a lot going on in their life, you know, where they can't get these certain thoughts out of their head, good or bad, you know, sometimes you're just excited about something yeah. and you can't stop thinking about it and, you know, whatever. Um, but if that's a problem, if it gets in the way of your sleep and it's jamming you up the next day, then I'm sure you can, you know, I'm sure meditation can kind of help is from what I hear about meditation. Yeah, I maybe. Know. I don't know. <laughs> you don't know anything about that. But I will say this. If you, if you want to go to bed earlier, you have to get up earlier. Like it doesn't work in reverse. You can't just force yourself to go to sleep at night. You have right. to just wake up earlier and be more tired at the end of the day. Yeah. And I love the feeling of when I'm so tired that my, my head hits the pillow and I fall asleep immediately. I love that feeling of yeah. just exhaustion. That's what I'm going for every day. See if I can just burn it, burn it out <laughs> and just yeah, be so tired at the end of the day. So that's my sleep routine. Probably yeah, made all kinds of doctors and stuff angry at me. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Doc Parsley. I know. I'm 
evil. like I think they say that the, the the ideal amount of sleep is seven and a half hours or something like that. But I would imagine it'd be different from person. Like if you're used to getting six hours sleep, doesn't your body conform? Like, you know, your sleep cycles, I think they conform to that six hours that they have. Dr. Dr. Echo has spoken. Yep. Your sleep schedule will conform. I learned that on the internet. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So in regards to, you know, achieving goals and just your pursuits in life, how do you deal with loved ones who seem to determine or who seem determined to hold you back from your goals? Um, And that's, I guess that's kind of assuming that you have loved ones that are determined to hold you back from your goals, right? Well, is that, you know, an issue? This is one of those questions that came in, and I think you voted <laughs> positive on this question, was let's answer this question. And why did you, why were you so, why did you want to answer this question because, so much? Because, and not that I've <clears throat> had this experience. Whoever you me. were that answered this question or that asked this question, I put a line through it. Echo brought it back from the dead. So, okay, here we go. Let's well, because I think people deal with this. I, I don't, th- I haven't experienced this personally, but I've seen it happen. I've seen it in other people <laughs> okay. where, and I think part of this is just my philosophy, but I, I think a big part of this, I believe a big part of this is you can apply it to every situation where it's a supposed loved one, whether it be your family, spouse, whatever, um, where they will hold you back sometimes. And sometimes it can be because they're, like jealous of you mm-hmm. or something. So, and not necessarily jealous. So they're going to say, um, you know, they're going to lie to you and say, Hey, that's a bad idea when it's really a good one or nothing like that. Just, they'll just be focusing on the bad part of it. So let's say, let's say you were unemployed for a little bit. You've been working hard to, to get this job and you finally get a job. And then you're, I don't know, a parent or whatever says, well, it's about time, <laughs> you know, so instead of dang, you know, you're you know, you got this job, congratulations, they they focus on the negative. And that can that can be discouraging on a personal level. Like like there was no there was no happiness, there was no encouragement, there was no no one saying um that no one f- making me feel like they were on my team mm-hmm. and make me feel like I'm alone in doing this. People do th- do that. And then they do oh, a bunch of other stuff as well, telling you the other part that I said, they will tell you it's a bad idea to start this new company. You know, because they're they may be afraid subconsciously or whatever that you know you might outshine them or you might do something good when they haven't done anything good. So oh, yes. So yeah. how do you deal with that? Um, and of course, a, a bunch of other ways that they can kind of get in the way. Um, this probably isn't going to be anything new, but you know how you surround yourself with like-minded people, or you surround yourself by certain types of people, mm-hmm. and you're going to start to become like that. So. I'm not saying disown any family members or loved ones. I'm not saying that, but you have to create boundaries, specific boundaries to these people. And I, I know a lot of people say, well, that's my family and I can't change that. Or that's my family. So, you know, I'm, and they feel like they're under this obligation to essentially give away part of their life. But I think it should be the opposite. I think that that's your family, so they should understand that you're on a path to success or you want to be on a path to success. And if they're in the way, then they're in the way and those boundaries have to be created. If they can't handle that, then they're, they're someone who, who is against you in your path. And if you're on a successful path and someone is against you, just the, the eventuality is that they're going to be cut out of your life. And if, if they can respect the boundaries, then boom, you can, you can keep them in your life and they can be them and you can, I love them for them, no matter how negative they're, and you can have all that. But if you don't, they're either going to bring you down or you got to come out, cut them out of your life, family or not. I think family should be held in a higher standard than your friend or your whatever, because they're, they're your family. They're, they're the one who should be treating you good. So you're saying your loved ones are treating you bad, they're the ones that should, they're the last people that should be treating you bad. They're your loved ones. So if they're not treating you good, then, like I said, they're the one in violation. Not you for pursuing your path and, you know, and not giving them the attention or not going to their house every other Saturday or whatever, like you're supposed to or whatever. It's their fault. Or not their fault, but it's their responsibility to support you. And if they're not, then like anyone else who's not supporting you, they should either have a boundary between you and them or be cut out of your life. 
I think that's fairly sound advice. Um, I, I'll tell you that a couple things from my perspective. First of all, I think that many people are negative in the world. And to coin a term that is used very often these days, a lot of people are haters. <laughs> And they don't want you to succeed. And, and we would see that. We'd even see that in the SEAL teams. Because SEAL teams is a bunch of really super competitive guys. And everybody is competitive with each other. And when someone starts doing something well, other people get can get jealous of them pretty quickly. And so that, like, like I had one uh, friend of mine who he decided that, hey, he was going to try and take like a year off or get get orders to go to an Ivy League school while he was in the SEAL teams. And he had applied and actually got into, a, a one, you know, a, one of the best colleges in the world to go there for a year and get a degree. And, you know, that's awesome. And he came to me and, and he said, hey, you know, I've got some guys that are telling me I shouldn't do this. It's going to be bad for my career and this, that, and the other thing. And I said, bro, <laughs> I hate to tell you this. These guys are just, they're haters. They're just jealous. The fact that you thought of this, the fact that you went on a limb, the fact that you made this happen, the fact that you put in an application, the fact that you took the, the test to get into the school, and now you're going to go there, you're going to have that on your resume, which is awesome. Mm. You know what? Don't worry about anybody else. They're, they're just, you know, I hate to use the word jealous, but they're jealous. Yeah. The fact that you're going to go out and make this happen, which I thought was, uh, I thought that was awesome. The other kind of contrary advice to what you just said is when people aren't approving what you're doing and they're saying negative things to you and they're not giving you the praise that you want for your what you're doing, that's your fault. <laughs> you're the one that's wanting praise. You're the one that's looking for approval. You're the one that wants all the support. Like, no, I don't expect anything from anybody because people are crazy, as I briefed earlier. And they're not going to give you support. If they're one of these people that are that are negative, they're going to be negative no matter what you do. So you yeah. can't be be hung up on getting their approval and getting their support. You go forth and conquer regardless of what people are trying to do to hold you back. No one's going to hold you back. Who's going to hold you back? How's that going to happen? Yeah. You don't let them hold you back. Yeah, and, and I agree with that last part. You don't let them hold you, hold you back. But here, here, here's an example. Let's say, let's say you're pursuing this I don't know, business degree or something, or you're, you're, you want to start a t-shirt company and it's going to, it takes all this time. You got to really get your knowledge down and you really do all your research and stuff. And it takes a lot of time. Let's say it takes uh, 15 hours a day, every single day while you're getting this thing up and running. But you visit your mom on the weekends, typically. And mm -hmm. you go down there, you help her with your, her yard work just because she wants company. Right. Um, you know, you do all this stuff. If you don't, she makes you feel guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can't make it or, or, I don't know, you're sick or something, she makes you feel guilty. So you're under this obligation. And when you grow up, it kind of gets ingrained in, into you. You know, like these relationships with your loved ones. Um, and not to mention they're your loved ones. They're supposed to love you, you know, and you're supposed to love them. Okay. Um, so I think you do care about the support. I think that's a natural part of it. If that's your loved ones, I'm, I'm not saying like your friend or your neighbor's not recognizing my, my success or whatever. That's your loved ones. Typically that's, if anyone's going to praise you, you're going to hope that they're the first ones. Yeah, but you can't be hung up on it, especially if they're crazy. Right, and that's, that's my point. That was your point. Yeah, okay. so. Accepted. So you say, you, you, <laughs> that's how they can hold you back. If it's ingrained in you that you have to be there for your mom, if she's trained you from a little kid to be to say, you owe me, I gave you life. Yeah, then it, then again, that's your fault. If you're letting them hold you back, then that's your fault. Right. You need so, to take ownership of it and move on. Yes. So yeah, exactly right. And that's what I mean by you create those barriers. Yeah, you, ha you have to suck it up or or cut them out of your life. And how how you would say about um about other people or other situations when you're in a job or, or a leadership situation where you can make them understand. If you can make them understand what you're doing, yeah. that's ideal, where you can maintain that the integrity is, of the relationship. You are correct. Now you just hit a home run <laughs> because you're going back to the basic principles. You right. have to let people understand why, and you have to make them understand why it's going to be beneficial for them in yeah. the long run. You yeah. know, I used to deal with guys when we were working hard, uh, you know, training guys for combat, or we were training for combat, 
and you think, oh, well, you know, you got to let these guys get home to their families. You know, they got to get home tonight. Let's let them out early. And I'd say, look, the best thing we can do for these guys to help them and their families is to train them as hard as possible. So in the long run, when they come home from combat, that's what we're here to do. Yeah. And everybody understands that message. So it's the same thing. You're right. When you explain to your family members, this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. This is how it's going to benefit me, which will thereby benefit you, which will thereby benefit our whole family. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Explain the why. Yeah. Next question. Um, <clears throat> what, is the, what are the bullet points and keys to success for motivating and engaging your team of leaders? Well, first of all, we just kind of covered that when we talked with uh, about about face for a solid hour, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is one of the questions here. I actually answered this question last time. So this is a question that you hear all the time is, you know, what can I do to motivate these guys? How can we get them engaged? And first of all, I want to say that leadership, although there are basic principles, fundamental principles that can be used, it is not something that can be bulletized. It is, it is like trying to bulletize how you play guitar or trying to bulletize how you play the violin. It is, a, it is an art. It is a practice. And there are many, many different ways to, to manipulate that instrument to make it make the noise that you want it to make. And that's what leadership is. Yeah. Leadership is not follow these four steps and you will become a good leader. It doesn't work that way. Mm. It is an art. Now, again, just like there's principles behind music, there's principles behind leadership and the fundamental principles stay the same. Mm. But how you engage with those and the nuances involved in executing those principles those principles is what makes leadership so challenging, which again is why we have a book, which is why we have a business, which is why there's leadership schools around the world, because it is a very challenging thing to do. Right. So, you know, the bullets are, I almost, after saying that, you know, what, what are the bullets? Well, you got to build relationships. You got to listen to people. You got to give respect. You got to, the main thing we talked about tonight with about face, you got to answer that. Why people got to understand why you're doing what you're doing and understand what their perspective is. So you got to communicate with them. It's all those things. But I think it's important to realize that leadership is a learning, constant learning process. It's a nuanced tool. There aren't any bulletized lists that are going to make you into a great leader tomorrow. What there are are principles that you can learn and understand and interpret and apply in different ways with different amplitudes at different times with different personalities. It's mayhem. Mm -hmm. It's mayhem. That's what makes it so challenging and so fun. And I, I, that's what makes me love to talk about leadership because there's it's an infinitely complex thing on in so many different ways. But all that being said, it is something that does follow core principles. Mm -hmm. And so learn those core principles, know those core principles, and that's what will make you a good leader. But don't look for a quick solution. Look for a comprehensive, a comprehensive uh, mass of knowledge and technique and understanding that will make you a better leader. Check. In your opinion, what are the best tactics in order to remain focused? Okay. Th this is individual for me because I know different people have different techniques. If you're, if you're using whatever techniques you have and they're not working well, then they're not working. So try mine. <laughs> So mine are when I have to do something focused, no music, no video, no TV playing in the background, none of that, no phone, turn that off and, and get focused on the task at hand. So what are you going to do to focus on the task at hand? You have to predetermine. There's a, there's a thing we used to use in the SEAL, team, SEAL teams. It's called task condition standard. Here's the task. Here's the conditions that are involved in the task, and here's the standards that you have to complete the task to. Mm -hmm. So I like to think of when I have to focus on something, I set up my own task conditions and standards for it. Mm -hmm. and, and a good example for me was uh, writing our book. When we were writing Extreme Ownership, Leif wrote about half of it, I wrote about half of it. We actually wrote a little bit more of half each because we, we both wrote chapters that aren't in there, and, but it was a lot of writing to do. Mm -hmm. and. 
how do you do that? How did I do it? I'll tell you. I set the task conditions and standards for what I needed to do. For me, it was what did I have to do? The task was to write. The condition was I, I was trying to write the draft so I knew it didn't have to be perfect and I got perfect out of my head because perfect can be bad. And the standard was I said, I'm, every day I'm gonna write a thousand words, regardless. I'm gonna write a thousand words and I tried to do it in an hour or less. So that's what I did. I made you know, no music, no phone, no videos playing in the background. I have an hour, I'm gonna sit down, I'm gonna get this done. So to me, that's a form of motivation. When you say, okay, this is what I'm gonna do, this is how I'm gonna do it, this is how long it's gonna take me, I'm gonna get it done, I'm probably gonna try and get it done faster than an hour. Right. And I used to time myself and be like, hey, that only took me you know, 49 minutes, that's pretty good. Kind of like a CrossFit exercise. Yeah, like you're going into it with a, with, a, with a challenge. And then you go about it in a, in a disciplined way. Right. And that's going to be the core of a lot of answers I give. Yeah, I think I'm going to disagree on a personal level. Um, from a personal standpoint, I mean, uh, with the no music thing, I think the music in my case helps. I think for a lot of people, music helps. It might. When I talk specifically about writing, then music does not help me. Especially music with like words. Ooh. Like if there's if, lyrics, you know? Um, but if it's like um, like some piano or something like that, okay. that G- can help. G- Echo, you are clear to listen to piano <laughs> as you create. Maybe some violin, some orchestra. I think that would work too for us. Cello. <laughs> <laughs> um, any advice... Oh. Was there more to that one? No. That was cool, right? I'm good. <clears throat> Any advice on balancing the thousands of things you have to do every day? Yeah. Again, chapter in the book. It's called Prioritize and Execute. Prioritize and Execute. That is the name of the chapter. That is a one of the basic principles, one of the laws of combat that we used, and that is that you're going to have all these problems happening on the battlefield. They're all going to be happening at the same time because Murphy's Law Mm-hmm. And when they do, if you try and handle them all at once and you try and do them all at once, you will fail. So what you have to do is you have to prioritize them and execute. So in business, that looks the same way. You know, you got all these problems, all these, you know, initiatives that you're trying to start, these things you got to handle. And that's, that's good. And that looks very similar on the battlefield. On a personal level, it's the same principle. But I'll tell you what I consider to be for lack of a better word, um, I will I will use this word. I, I will tell you the hack, <laughs> a hack, the hack, the hack for this. Uh, and this is no genius thing here. If you really want to get things done, make a list of what you need to do the next day. Make it in a priority. Uh, what you actually need to do is schedule the time that you're going to execute those tasks. This is a piece that a lot of people miss. So I guess it is a little bit bigger of a hack than, mm. than I gave it credit for. You have to say, okay, I've got to do these six things tomorrow. You've got to put on your schedule when you are going to do those things. And that really drives execution because it puts a time limit on it and it makes you get on there and get it started and get it done so you can move on to the next task. So task lists and calendars should actually be connected, you know, intimately. (laughs) And then once you have that in place, you get up and you go and you get it done. Wake up early and make it happen. Prioritize and execute. That's what we do. New Year's resolutions. 2016 is coming up in a few days. So, what's your one thing for 2016 that you need to do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and or unnecessary? And that's, that's one of the New Year's resolution questions that we pulled out because I got a bunch of them. <laughs> Because everyone's thinking, you know, what, what, is, what are we all going to do for the big New Year's resolution? Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you seem pretty fired up by the New Year's resolution <laughs> thing. So, so what are your thoughts here? Uh, my, uh, what, like my personal New Year's resolution? And or thoughts therein. 
Uh, I, you know, I'm gonna be honest. I haven't come up with any specific ones right now. Um, maybe I will. Maybe I won't. Um, but I think, yeah, I think I'll evaluate where I want to be, where I am, and see if I can connect those dots. Whatever that looks like, hey, you know, I, I don't know yet, but we'll see. <clears throat> well, that sounds real organized. <laughs> Anyone that just heard that in the world, um, please ignore and delete from your mind. Uh, okay, well, actually, here's the funny thing. Is I think that resolutions are, for the most part, little feel-good statements <laughs> that people use to justify a delay in execution. That, that's what I think. So I say don't make a new year's resolution for tomorrow. Don't execute then execute now execute now. And when I say execute now, I mean now and now and now and now and continually execute what it is you're trying to do. And the other thing about a new year's resolution is it's a year. That's a big, long chunk of time. And that type of goal to anybody, I don't care who you are, a year is too long, it's too big of a chunk. So saying that you're gonna make that type of a long-term strategic goal, it's like shooting, when you shoot, if you ever shot weapons before, um, if you look at the target, the long target that's 400 meters away, if you, st if you look at the target as you look at it, your vision can't hold that focus and it becomes blurry. Right. So you have to shift back to the front side of your weapon which is only two and a half feet away. Mm -hmm. And then that becomes very clear and the, and the long distance target in the background fades a little bit, but that's okay because you can see that thing right in front of you and that's what you want to make happen. So what you want to do is you want to set those short term uh, goals that are closer than a year away that's going to be blurry and it's going to lose its impact and you're going to not see it anymore. So make up that long term strategic goal, that's fine, but make sure you make some short term tactical goals that are closer. Now, now that being said, to close this out, since the last question that I had, I would say don't make a New Year's resolution to be a better person in 2016. I would say make a resolution to be a better person now. Make it a resolution of discipline to get better, smarter, faster, stronger, healthier, more productive, less agitated, to eat cleaner, live more, to go and do. Do all those things. But don't do them on New Year's Eve. Don't do them on New Year's Day. Do them now. That that resolution of discipline to work and follow through and maintain your will that'll result in the freedom that you're looking for and yes you heard it once again discipline equals freedom discipline equals freedom and with that that's all i got thank you mr echo Thank you. Everyone that's out there listening, we appreciate it. We will see you next time. Keep getting better. <laughs>